Hello, and welcome to the Digital Workspace Works podcast. I'm Ryan Purvis, your host, supported by our producer Heather Bicknell. In this series, you'll hear stories and opinions from experts in the field, stories from the front lines, the problems they face and how they solve them, the areas they're focused on from technology, people and processes, to the approaches they took that will help you to get to the scripts for the digital workspace inner workings. So there's two articles that I've sent you to have a read, which I thought were quite interesting. Did you have a chance to, to have a read? I did, yeah. Which one, uh, which one sparked your interest the most? I think, you know, we could probably maybe cover a little bit of both because the Wired one was so short. Mm. Um, but I feel like there's more to dig into for me with the CIO piece. Mm. What did you sure. think? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing that I sort of... Uh, with, with, uh, with the wide one, which I liked, was the move back to cellularized business parks. So having business parks that are out of this out of the city, um, that'll have sort of uh, buildings that'll have in the middle of them parks or or common areas and and all that sort of stuff. I thought was quite quite a nice because you don't see them as much in the UK because they really want oh, okay they, they do exist it's not like they don't exist, um, but most most organizations are in the city which is obviously an you know a very compacted um loaded area uh you can go out to sort of areas like maidenhead or uh, thames valley thames valley which which are big business parks um but it's, it's, a, it's a nice thought that they're going to move that, that if that's where things go to a business park where it's more balanced because now people are going to be com- commuting less and sharing more um, you'll probably have a nicer business park experience than, than a sort of cubicle office experience. Yeah, I mean, it sounds nice for for organizations who can who can do that. Um, I guess I just really associate that with, you know, Silicon Valley, the various Google, Apple, you mm. know, those kind of campuses. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, well, I suppose it's, it's, it's going back to almost a satellite model because um, the other thing they talked about in the article was, was sort of becoming more um, bicycle focused. So people being able to, to well, in certain areas they would, they would design it more for cycles and walking pedestrians. Um, and they mentioned specifically Paddington and Tottenport Road stations where they've done this. And I remember Paddington because I used to have a, one of the companies I was with the headquarters for the UK was was in the Padding, just off Paddington, um, and and the, you know the amount of people going through that at a given time re- required it to be very pedestrian friendly, um, but it, it does uh, it does seem like a better way to avoid infection and the, and the like if you can cycle on your own as opposed to sharing public transport with everybody. How bike friendly is London? Um, in, in parts it's quite friendly in parts it's not so they've been spending um, so when I moved here which is what 10, 19 years ago um, they had Boris bikes in place for a long time which was um, and then Boris Johnson as mayor of London had put in I think it was uh, sponsored by Barclays um, they named them Boris bikes? I think the nickname was Boris bikes but they were okay. Barclays bikes they, so <laughs> okay. they're, all brand, they're all branded um, blue and you know, the idea behind that is you could basically stop at any station and you could rent a bike. Um, I think the first half an hour is free. And then after that, you pay sort of two pounds a day or something like that. It go up to two pounds a day. And the idea is you could cycle from one point to another point. Um, then about five years ago, six years ago, they changed over from Barclays to Santander. Um, so now they rent bikes, um, but they're still there. So with that starting, um, there was quite a lot of work done to turn um, or, or create bicycle lanes, um, riding areas. Uh, some roads were closed off completely to, to create cycling a cycling highway. Um, so, so there's definitely a move towards it. Uh, and you do see people in the morning sort of you know, jumping on the train with their, their fold-up bike, a Brompton or something like that. Um, so that they, you know, they cycle to the station and they get to the station on the other side and they cycle from the station to the office instead of going on the, um, the, the bus or the tube to get to the office, which 
to me is, is the way to do it. You know, if I can avoid the tube, I'll avoid it. Um, so, so it's, it's quite a good culture and, and, and sort of with this with the pandemic being around and the lockdown and that sort of stuff. Um, I've seen a lot of people around my area cycling a lot. Now, whether they were cycling before or not, I don't know, but there's definitely a lot of people on the roads, uh, getting the exercise that way. I mean, it's one of the best technologies ever invented. If you think about it for, for human to move around, um, in the sense of, uh, you know, for every step you take that, that cycle is, has got a, um, a proportionally, um, what's the word? Uh, I'm trying to, so, so you're for every push you take on your, on your cycle, you, you can move X amount of meters before you push again. So your mm-hmm. translation of, of effort to, to distance is really, really good. Um, so they're quite, I mean, I, I would see it being with, with this and what they were saying in this article, um, they're pushing more and more for that to be the way of, of moving people around, which can only be better for the climate and for people that are going into the cities. Um, to, to, um, or from the health point of view, at least. Definitely. Yeah. I was a bike commuter for many years. Um, and I've always enjoyed it. I mean, it, you, it's funny cause you have to kind of, it's not, um, it's not as it, it takes, it requires a little bit more thought and planning than, um, driving or, or taking public transit just in, you know, what, what you can wear and what the weather's like and having, you know, you can't carry an umbrella. So you have rain gear and, and getting, um, any sort of, you know, reflectors or safety equipment. Mm. But, um, it is a nice, I've always found it to be kind of a relaxing way to, to get in and out, and out of, um, work. It kind of creates a nice transition. Um, and recently I've been, um, I just walk to work cause it's like not, not too far away. Um, and I've always enjoyed that. Yeah. I mean, I've also been going for the walk, um, and I've been debating a bike for a while and now with, um, where we live towards where I live to where the station is, it's just, it's a 25 minute walk, which is just too long to make it, a um, it makes my day, it'll make my day longer. If I, if I walk there and walk back. So the bike is definitely something I'm thinking about. And I actually got a new holder for my phone called the quad lock, which is quite an impressive, um, well, I really, I really like it. I mean, I've got, I've, I've got all the, all the accessories. So you, you get a, um, a stand that I've got on my desk and I lock my phone into it. It's got a wireless charger that you can buy to put into it. So the minute I get to my desk, I, I put it on the chart on this quad lock, which is sort of a, it's a, you, you put it on at 45 degrees and then you go either clockwise or anti-clockwise, depending which way you want the phone to be. And then it locks into place. And then, then it sits there on the stand and it's, and if I'm on a call where I've used my phone to connect then I've got the camera pointing to me at the right, uh, right angle. It, it doesn't adjust, um, the, um, the angle, but it's pretty much already at the right angle to get me on the in video for, for the call. Uh, and then I put that in the same sort of, because I've got one for the car, um, which I've got the same, you know, charging all the rest of it. So it's great when I get in the car and I sort of put my phone on to navigate somewhere, then that's all all the same mechanism. So it's got a nice cover that, that, that protects it, all that kind of stuff. And this actually comes, coming back to the bike. My cousin showed it to me a couple of weeks ago and he's put on his motorbike. So he uses that for, he's got, he built his own motorcycle and he took out this, he took off the, um, what the speedo might have been the RPM gauge, and he's put his phone with this with this quad lock connector. Um, so he's got a GPS, and it actually does. He's got an app that basically it's his uh, digital display is his phone on his bike. And the reason why he he did that is because the quad lock is is so str- is strong enough that his phone actually is is held in the right position and charges and all that kind of stuff. So it's quite a nifty um, component. So the reason why I'm saying that is that when I get my bicycle, uh, I'm going to put the same quad lock mechanism on there, um, so I can do the navigation and all that kind of stuff using using the phone. Um, it's something if you ever get back into riding, it's worth looking at. Yeah, I think there are some, um, like bike handlebar and, and different phone, um, mm, attachments. Mm. Yeah. 
or if you're, if you're really wanting to, um, spring for something, you can get a nice Garmin that will have GPS. I just have like a regular old speedometer that I use. Um, I worked in a bike shop for a few years, so I have, I have a bit of gear. Um, (laughs) (laughs) and I thought I, um, while I was there, I made sure that I, um, used all the employee discounts and stuff to build out my own, my own bike. So I'm very proud of my, my bike, but I haven't gotten out um this summer yet which is unfortunate i need to do that i just need to replace my tubes um i think a great option for a lot of people just while we're on this subject is some sort of like pedal assist or or e-bike um Mm. they tend to be you know more expensive of course but they can make it a little bit easier for you to to do commutes you know i think probably for a lot of people one of the main barriers is just it's it might be a little bit far for them to bike commute so having like you know, an electronic assist with that would, would make it a lot easier. Yeah. Someone I knew was trying to do that because he used to cycle in from his house to the city. And I can't remember how far it was. I want to say something like 30 miles or 20 miles. It was, it was far enough that it wasn't, it wasn't trivial. It took him about an hour and 10 minutes to cycle in. Um, and he would work and he'd get in for seven and he would leave late at night as well and cycle back. And you just, and I was just thinking, you know, that. Two hours on the bike is, uh, especially after a long, long day, I suppose it's good for your de-stress. Um, but I remember him saying that he was looking at an e-bike just just for those days when you, you, you're you tired and you're cycling up that long hill um, and your legs aren't, aren't feeling it. Um, they must be must be getting, coming down in price, I would think. The technology must be getting there. Yeah, I feel like doing that, doing that kind of cue every day would be pretty brutal. It sounds like. Yeah, I, don't know. I, I wouldn't. Uh, I mean, he was he he obviously knew it for years, so it kind of it probably became the, the norm, mm-hmm. um, and your body probably gets used to it. But yeah, when he, I remember when I first moved here, it was like, geez, dude, that's hectic. Really, really can't believe you do that every day. Um, anyway, um, so the other article. So getting back to what we were chatting today. Um, this was the 14 technology winners and losers post uh, on the CIO.com website. Um, did, uh, maybe you start as opposed to me, because I was all waffle. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I, I actually, I had this post. Of course, I, you know, I subscribed to CIO as well. So I got the newsletter um, pushing it out. But I, I feel like I've seen it um, around quite a bit. But I feel like you can boil it down to the technology winners are things that are typically software and don't require people to be together in in groups. And then the losers are things where you need to have um, physical presence for them to matter. So in that case, there was nothing I found particularly surprising about their list. Um, Mm -hmm. But maybe we can just dive into some of the list options and kind of talk talk through those, I guess. Is, is there anything that, that stood out to you as a surprising winner or loser? Um, yeah, so so I guess, I mean, if I if I look at, at some of these, these items, so we've got um, Bring Your Own Device was a winner. Uh, and, and obviously that was a fad to an extent a lot for a while ago. Um, and then it, and it was almost one of those things that yeah, let's, let's let everyone bring their own devices in. And then the actual reality of how you manage those devices sort of set in and became a lot more complicated than, than not. Um, that, that BYD has come back in is interesting. Although I think the technology that, that exists nowadays, like, you know, you think about things like Intune, for example, where it's a bit easier to manage an external device, um, has made it more prevalent. But I think the needs must sort of, overwrote everything. So and I was listening to a call yesterday, um, one of the, the networking things that I'm a part of, where they actually had to issue out a whole bunch of vanilla laptops to their staff and they didn't give a number, but but you know, sort of twenty five thousand staff they had to buy a certain amount because those people actually didn't have home devices. Um, and it was something they wanted to avoid in the future. And one of the things they mentioned as part of their strategy now was to actually have a BYOD fund um, where they would give, and it wasn't a lot of money, but I, I think it was somewhere in the, in the hundreds of dollars range 
uh, to staff at a certain level to go and buy their own devices to use. Um, so I was quite surprised that this came up as, as, as a winner. I say, when I say surprised, I'm surprised it's still around as, as, um, as a concept that, that some of these people weren't ready for it uh, in that sense. You think about iPads and you think about um, you know, buying Chromebooks, which are not too expensive. Um, people should be able to, you know, typically in an in information worker age, if they do those sort of jobs, should be able to buy those devices and with Office 365 connect in. Yeah, I think, well, one of the points that the article made was that since iPads, you know, and we were just talking about this in a previous episode, but since iPads and phones can do so much more um, for us that they can satisfy a lot of people's, you know, everyday computing needs. So not everyone may have a laptop for that reason, you know, if the the iPad is Mm. good enough for them. So I think when it came time to, um, you know, have to fully work from home, um, maybe that wasn't enough for some people, Mm. you know, eight hour, eight hour work device. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, the, the counterpoint to the BYOD was that corporate hardware and specifically, you know, desktops were going to be a loser. And, you know, this makes sense to me as a longer term trend, because I, I feel like BYOD, I, BYOD could, you know, easily fizzle out again when offices do open up. Um, but the move to a mobile, a more mobile strategy, um, to be able to have a more flexible workspace, you know, into if you need to respond to an emergency like this again, I feel like um, the case for, for laptops will be a lot stronger. Yeah, well, I mean, because because you talk about corporate hardware, and, and a lot of the, the trend, at least in in the bigger companies, has been to go VDI in some form of VDI, and with um, WBD um, as an offering. It all, it all falls over if you don't have that BYD device. You don't have something, mm-hmm. um, you know. And I, and I, th- I was thinking about the Agile offering where, where you plug in a USB um, stick into a device, and then that turns it into a corporate device for you, basically. Um, mm-hmm. Probably over, so probably oversimplifying what they're trying to do, but but not. Um, and but that still requires you to have that that device at home, something, you know, whether it's whether it's an old device or or a low power device to get you to get you going. So I think there's almost a, a, a benefit that needs to be associated to employees that they, they have some sort of uh, allowance to go and buy a device and, and IT almost needs to specify that if you go and buy a device, you know, it needs to be, I don't know, for argument's sake, an i5 processor with, with 16 gigs of RAM, um, at least get some sort of longevity out of the device as opposed to going to buy you know, the cheapest, cheapest thing they can find and then pocketing the difference and, and complaining to IT that, that they can't do anything. Yeah, I have heard of some companies planning for um, this sort of redundancy where, and and maybe it's, you know, part of it's giving people budget to, to buy their own device and, and bring it home, but just, you know, provisioning them from the company. So instead of, when everyone mm. goes back, taking all of the all of the hardware, you know, any monitors, any mice, keyboards, whatever they took from the office, instead of having people take that back in to leave it and then buy everything again for the office so that everyone has the workstation they need at home and everyone has it at the office and just plan plan for that as a strategy going forward. Yeah, actually, what I heard yesterday from a few companies, what they were saying is that the, that the, that the people that were – that was set up by the company at home, we're going to leave the kit that they had in the house and not bring it back. And they were going to reprovision in the office if they had to reprovision. So almost take that as a, as a hit. Um, of setting them up. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like right now it's going to be so interesting. Like we have this whole record of, podcasts and, you know, videos, just people talking their way through this pandemic. Um, just keep imagining like if we could listen back on podcasts from the Spanish flu times and what people would be saying. Um, but you know, I feel like if you 
are hoping to bring employees back into the office anytime soon, you know, before we have a vaccine and this threat has kind of dissipated, um, you have to build that agility in, right? And Agile was another winner mm. on this list um, because, you know, you don't know when um, you might need to, you know, when your city might go on lockdown again and everyone has to go home and you want to avoid the sort of panic that um, you had to go through the first time. Well, you see that's happened in Beijing already today. They've had to go back into lockdown. Or they've, they've, had, they've had a second wave already, so they've had to, make, cancel, they had to cancel a lot of things and, and basically start the process again of, of um, not social distancing. Uh, they didn't call it lockdown, they call it something else. Um, so, yeah, exactly that. Being, being flexible and agile uh, is, is always going to be important. I mean, everyone that I spoke with yesterday or listened to yesterday had said the same thing. Any plan they made longer than, than a week ahead got changed. And in some cases, it was getting changed daily, um, just to just to react to the situation the whole time, which is which is fine for a short period of time. I mean, this, the lockdown uh, in the UK was downgraded today from level four to level three, so technically we've been in, in probably this for about a month. Um, not that we've ever really followed any, you know, so we've never been a, a noted thing that we have five levels or three levels until recently. Um, yeah, they could easily go back to level four, which means more lockdowns and, and the rest of it all can go down to level two, which means more freedom. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's all happening on a, a constantly changing basis. Yeah, this article did prompt me to look into contact tracing a little bit more. So I went down on a rabbit hole last night where I was, you know, diving into some, you know, research white papers and whatnot, just to try to understand the, um, uh, the role, if any, of like the app based approach, um, such as the one that Google and Apple came together to to work on with the, you know, Bluetooth signaling um, to, to enable people to be uh, linked and notified with well, while preserving their privacy as well. Um, yeah, yeah and that's that, that was always going to be a sticky one. Um, I see that I see the NHS app has been um discontinued uh i think it was an article i read yesterday and they're now going to follow the apple or google option which which is a totally anonymized version mm -hmm. um whereas i think the nhs one was not anonymized or it, it, was, it was less it was less um, privacy conscious um yeah and, and if you look at how it was used in china uh there was a couple of videos that floated around sort of middle of of may where um, if you arrived in the country, you, there was a rag system and you, you basically, if you're red, you have to self-isolate. If you're amber, you are under cautionary. And if you are green, you're allowed to do certain things. Uh, or you're allowed to do most things. Um, and that was all tied into, um, what's it, chat application? Is it WeChat? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that like, for example, the journalist that arrived there, he was marked as red when he got this. So he had to wait two weeks in, in his hotel or his little apartment, one of the two. Um, and then when he went to Amber, he was allowed out, but he had to be uh, cautious and he wasn't allowed to drive a car. He only was allowed to take, he was only allowed to walk to places. Um, and then when he got to green, he was allowed to drive. Yeah. And if, uh, you know, you know, privacy and, um, and all aside to me, um, kind of the biggest flaw with this, with trying to bring technology into it is adoption. So of course, if you have, you know, a country that's enforcing it, you know, a hundred percent on everyone, you know, everyone has to comply with this and allow me to put this thing on their phone. Um, you know, then you have great coverage, right. Um, mm. to make this kind of thing work. Um, but I just don't, I, I know, um, there's a few U S states considering it, um, the, the app based approach, um, just to, to, um, supplement the, uh, normal contact tracing method. That's very manual. Um, just mm -hmm. calling people, um, and getting workers, uh, who are set up to, to do that. But, um, I just don't see the U S having, um, the buy people, people opting into that and self-reporting, um, I, I, I guess Singapore has already rolled out, um, a contact tracing app like this. And I think they only have 20% participation, 
which I think um, the article said would capture like three to four percent or something of, um, you know, times where where this where you might um, be near someone who's infected or it was something low like that in terms of a success rate for, for what it was trying to do. So I guess that's that's the issue with um, trying to to make this happen as a as a volunteer thing, um, which I think is what, you know, we would we would need it to be um, mm-hmm. to get the buy in from folks. So to me, that was the major downfall. But, yeah, I mean, um, it sounds like the UK was has been considering it more strongly. Um, my understanding was that you know, they've had to move away from the model that they were doing because Apple said, like, no, we won't support that. But. I hadn't read it. I actually hadn't read the details, to be honest. Mm-hmm. I I read, I still, it's on my sort of open tabs to read. Um, all, all I'd seen as a headline was that they had discontinued the NHS app and that they were going to use the, the Google model, which I believe would be the Apple model. Yeah. Um, and that and that was using anonymized signatures and uh, and that sort of sort of thing. So you would get notified via um, the app that you've been close to someone that was infected, but you'd have no idea, and no one else would know, unless they were also near that person um, who was who, that that there was an infection and it could could affect you. Uh, and you'd have to then obviously contact your GP or, or whatever it is to um, to take it forward. Uh, it was the cleanest way of doing it, I think, um, with protecting privacy and and getting the desired result of contact tracing. Yeah, it, I think it's, you know, through the low band Bluetooth um, approach and then storing the the data would be anonymous and stored on everyone's, you know, on your phone. So you'd have like that record just locally. And I think the, the other approach, either using location data or storing, storing data in some sort of, um, government database, I think was what, um, the, the initial thought was with the, with the UK. Um, but, um, Apple and Google were trying to, to avoid that. So I think it was, there's a, there was an interesting slate article on it, um, which kind of talked about how, you know, this is an example of turning, the whole Silicon Valley privacy story on its on its head a bit because we typically think of, you know, I guess Apple is a bit of a better reputation here, but um, <laughs> other tech companies, you know, not not being privacy conscious first. Um, so mm-hmm. to have them kind of be the ones to build that into the model is sort of a nice change of pace. Yeah, uh, in fairness to to, well, it's, I mean, Apple has been has always been the strongest advocate for privacy. Um, that they were working with Google on this and, that, and, and they've got a solution together kind of gives me some confidence that the solution might actually be safe in inverted commas. If, if I, and, and, you know, I shouldn't say never, but if I was on an Android dev- device, not that I ever would be, um, I wouldn't trust Google with that data because uh, they, they are the biggest advertising company in the world. Uh, let's, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, that Apple's involved brings some credibility. And yeah, I mean, to be honest, if I, if, if I would probably sign up for the contact tracing app, but I would do it only if Apple was involved. And I think that's that's where everyone's going. It, it does surprise me that there's so many sort of um, uh, bespoke solutions being built. So, you know, I think there were a couple of states in America that were building their own their own contact tracing apps. Rather than, rather than just go to the big suppliers like Apple and Google and say, look, you know, it's your hardware. Can you do something that, that keeps the privacy strong, that gives us the desired result, which is what they offer to do anyway. And that becomes part of the core, the core product, and you can opt into it on the product, but it's installed for you. You don't, you know, it's not automatically turned on. You just have to go in and opt into it. But it shouldn't be um, too much choice, I think, because we're trying to deal with something that hasn't really happened before. And you talked about the Spanish flu, which you know, was a hundred years ago. Um, this is, you know, one of those once in a lifetime events again, really. So it's a little bit of extra special attention is probably warranted. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have so much better healthcare systems and technology and knowledge than we do then. Um, you know, and, and as many people have um yeah, I, I mean I guess uh, the other the other thing I wanted to note with the um Apple and Google app was the um the thought that once 
once we don't need this technology anymore, you know, once this pandemic is over, that it would be um, the whole thing would be wiped from the next OS update so that Google and Apple, Google especially, like there's no there'd be no data to make use of anymore because they just get rid of that functionality um, with an update, which I thought was was, again, like a reassuring approach that that seemed to be built in. Yeah, not to be too cynical, but but that that requires someone to actually say it's over. Um, yeah, and and it's too easy to say it's, it's never going to go away. Um, yeah, for that sort of stay there. I mean, I, I almost take the opposite view to that to say, look, you, you're welcome to that data. Um, I don't know if you ever read Kevin Kelly's book. Um, I think it's called the Twelve Eventualities or something like that. Um, but one of those things is your data is going to be out there. You know, you're going to choose what's out there, but it's inevitable that it's going to be out there. Um, and that's just one of those things. So, so if uh, I almost say, when I say I don't have a problem because it's anonymized and, and as I said, Apple's involved, so I'm a little more confident and, and I haven't done the deep analysis of it. You welcome to it in that sense, because if it helps solve the problem, keep everyone healthy and all that sort of stuff, then, then use it. When it gets into the level of, you know, you're selling me something because I went to the shops twice today, or you're selling my patent to someone else and you're making money out of it, then I have a, a different issue with it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, I think we're all we're all aware that there are many ways that we have, you know, that a lot of we've lost a lot of privacy, right? Um, so that to a certain extent, a lot of this information is already. Um, you know, can already be found. But um, mm. yeah, I mean, I think at least in the US, I think it's not even it's not this it's not, you know, it's kind of frustrating because I feel like the the sentiment isn't around. I don't want to have this app because of privacy necessarily. It's just like, um, you know, unfortunately, this has I feel like it's been drawn on on political lines. So, um, you know, people just just don't some people just don't care. Um, and we're not in for that reason. So I don't think we'd meet the, I think it's like a 60% of the population, um, needs to opt in for it to work. So I just don't, don't see that happening. Maybe in some cities, you know, I think maybe in, in different locations, it could be successful, but. Yeah. Which, which brings me on to sort of my last item on this thing that I, that I was, I wouldn't say surprised by, but I, that it came up as such a big loser and that was the modeling and, and past data. Um, and this probably comes, and, and the way the article phrased it was, was around the AI and machine learning uh, buzzwords and, and their activity in the last sort of, I don't know, five years, let's say, well, the, the increased activity. Um, almost, that, almost saying here that everything that we've had before this pandemic can be thrown away now because the pandemic's changed everything. And I, and I didn't really agree with that. I thought, yeah, potentially it's changed some things and, and there's data that, that would have to be, I want to say tossed out, but at least re, realigned. But I think stuff that's happened in history can always be used to predict of some of the future. Uh, I mean, that's kind of the, the, whole, the whole deal behind machine learning and, and AI is being able to address the patterns and, and, and optimize them for the future. I don't know if yeah, you feel yeah. the same thoughts. Sorry. I, yeah, I did. I, you know, it seemed like an oversimplification. Um, and it really depends what sort of data sets you're talking about, right, in terms of whether benchmarking would still be relevant. Um, but I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I think maybe to be um, to be generous, their their point was probably that, you know, for the near term that um this activity has made a lot of modeling more difficult than it was before. It's, it's harder to, you know, predict with certainty, right? Because there are, there are more unknowns and things aren't um, so stable. So um, in terms of immediate forecasting for some things through the pandemic, I, I can see how um, that would be trickier to do right now. Mm. No, for sure. And, and that's, yeah, so it's 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 kind of expected at this point in time that we have to we we can't um, there's not, the stability is not there as much as we'd all, all like it to be. I mean, we don't know when this is going to in in a sense end. Okay, is this another three months? Is it another six months? Is it just another two weeks? Don't know. 
Yeah, just got to take it day by day, week by week right now. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right, and this was uh, anything else to cover, maybe we end off there. Yeah, no, I think that's good. Super. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Heather Bicknell is our producer and editor. Thank you, Heather, for your hard work on this episode. Please subscribe to the series and rate us on iTunes or the Google Play Store. Follow us on Twitter at the DWW Podcast. The show notes and transcripts will be available on the website, www.digitalworkspace.works. Please also visit our website, www.digitalworkspace.works, and subscribe to our newsletter. And lastly, if you found this episode useful, please share with your friends or colleagues.